In the early days of cosmology, we were only able to observe invisible light. Now, through our advances, we are able to observe the universe in both X-ray and gamma rays, both of which are produced by plasma processes. The plasma universe derived from these observations in these regions is drastically different from the currently accepted visible light universe based on the visible light observations. So let's find out more about Hannes Alvin's view of the cosmology in a plasma universe. The required shift from our standard model to the plasma model is akin to the shift that was required that moved us from a geocentric model to a heliospheric model. And it seems to bring with it very similar opposition to the new paradigm. Let's explore some of the modifications Hannes Alvin proposed to bring cosmology over to this new paradigm. So firstly, let's explore some of the properties of the plasma universe. The first point is that the same laws of plasma physics will hold both for plasma in the laboratory, the magnetosphere, and the heliosphere, and right out into interstellar space. Number two, in order to understand the phenomena in a certain plasma region, it is necessary to map not only the magnetic field, but also the electric field and the electric currents. Number three, a number of plasma phenomena like double layers, critical velocity, pinch effect, and the properties of electric circuits are of decisive importance. Number four, space is filled with a network of currents which transfer energy and momentum over large distances. The currents often pinch into filaments or surface current, and the latter are likely to give space a cellular structure. Oscar Klein, based on Dirac's theory, first suggested that the universe might be matter and antimatter symmetric. Both continuous creation and the Big Bang theory would have to remove this problem as it leads to a homogeneous universe. Both theories would attempt to remove this symmetry. No unbiased discussion on this topic has managed to take place with objections pointing out quickly that no one has actually demonstrated in an unquestionable way the existence of cosmic antimatter. And although this may well be true, it is also true that no one has demonstrated that the universe is not symmetric. The plasma universe model introduces important new concepts in this discussion. From the magnetospheric studies, it has become obvious that there is a current layer which separates space into two regions with different magnetism, temperature, density, and frequently different chemical compositions. Outside this layer, there is solar wind hydrogen, whereas inside the layer, oxygen evaporated from the ionosphere often dominates. The magnetopores forms a strong separation layer holding back what is on the other side. And that is not to say that nothing is able to escape or get in. There are complex mechanisms which do allow hydrogen into the magnetopores and certain solar events that can cause oxygen to leak out. The layer acts almost like a semi-permeable membrane. Now this process of selected separation is not just confined to the magnetopores, but is observed also in the sun. It is therefore impossible to deny that space in general must have a cellular structure. In interstellar and intergalactic space, the chemicals being separated on either side of these membranes may instead be matter and antimatter. When combined with Leidenfrost's layer theory, these layers, if static, emit a negligible amount of radiation and could be depicted as a thin, very hot layer of almost complete vacuum. Now this leads us to the notion that in a plasma universe there may very well be a symmetry between matter and antimatter. Now how could we tell an antimatter star from a matter star? It would still obey the same laws of gravity and electromagnetism, albeit reverse charge. Its radiation and the spectrum it would emit would be identical to a matter star. 
Now you may speculate that if the solar wind of a matter star met the solar wind of an antimatter star, they would annihilate, producing gamma ray emissions. There is, however, plenty of room for a large number of Leidenfrost layers to be present, separating the matter from the antimatter. So how would we go about constructing the evolution, the history of a plasma universe? There are two main ways in which this could be approached. The first is what is known as the prophetic approach. Now a guess is made about the state a very long time ago and this is made credible by some sort of prophetic authority. This approach often assumes that there was a creation at a certain time and it is often claimed that we know more about this event than about somewhat more recent times. The second way is the actualistic approach. We start from observing the present state and we try to extrapolate backwards in time to increasingly more ancient states. From this follows that the further backwards we go, the larger is the uncertainty about the state. This approach does not necessarily lead to a creation at a certain time, but it also does not exclude these possibilities. So let's look at the Hubble data, and in particular the Hubble diagram. What does this diagram actually tell us? Now, the Hubble diagram is most often plotted on a logarithmic scale. Now many would say that this diagram proves a Big Bang event. Extrapolate the line backwards and at some point all the objects are on top of each other. Now this conclusion is based on a very elementary logical mistake. All dogs are animals does not prove that all animals are dogs. First of all, the observed redshift does not necessarily derive from a longitudinal Doppler shift. They could just as well, in part, derive from a transverse Doppler effect. Leaving out totally the evidence to support part of this may also be intrinsic redshift. Even if we assumed it was all due to longitudinal redshift, it would lead to a diagram that would show that they were much closer together in the past, but not necessarily on top of each other. Now let us consider some of the prophetic aspects of the Big Bang model. Number one, there is some orders of magnitude more mass in the universe than we actually observe, i.e. a lot of it, the majority of it, is actually missing. Number two, the Hubble expansion was caused by a supernatural effect at a singular point. Number three, the current universe does not contain an appreciable amount of antimatter, breaking Klein's model. Number four, cosmology can be treated by homogeneous models. Now, if we were able to construct a plasma universe, a better model would be, number one, that there is matter and antimatter symmetry, thereby upholding Klein's model. Number two, the Hubble expansion is caused by well-known processes, among them the energy released by annihilation, in a region of about 10 billion light years. Number three, the universe does not contain large amounts of missing mass. And number four, the universe is highly inhomogeneous and has a cellular structure. Now, it is not suggested that we fully adopt Klein's model, as he proposed that the early universe consisted of a very large sphere of matter and antimatter, which puts it firmly in the prophetic realm. In this model, the density initially is low enough that annihilation does not play a major role. Gravity would start to contract the cloud, causing the annihilation effect to increase. And as the cloud continues to collapse, this would rapidly increase, creating an outward pressure, resulting in the expansion we see today. His picture of the evolution after this event can be used as a guide to an evolutionary, actualistic approach. Whether this is correct or not can only be found if the observed present state of the universe is used as a basis for reconstruction of the increasingly older states. In the plasma universe, not only the present state but also the state in the past is of importance. The properties of the plasma before this turning point, so before um, the point at which the universe started to expand, may well have been very different to after. Alvin states that 
we should focus on the reconstruction up to the turning point based on the observed data and plasma physics, and only when we have completed that should we focus on the events before that. So don't focus on the start, but work backwards based on what we see and the rules of nature and those new rules of plasma physics. So 40 years later, here we are, and the plasma universe is only just starting to make inroads into mainstream science. Doggedly, they hold on to their creation theory, despite the mounting problems. I really like Alvin's approach of working backwards, rather than making assumptions and drawing forwards. The idea of a symmetric universe of matter and antimatter is also something which, until I had read this paper, I wouldn't even have considered. And it does present some very interesting possibilities for explaining the existence of some of those very high energy sources and the idea that they can be separated through layers similar to the double layers is also very interesting. Now that is not to say that it is also possible that we live in a universe that has absolutely no antimatter. It would only be an effect that we would be able to generate in our laboratories but no cosmical antimatter would exist. Alvin does point this out in his paper, but his view is that he favours the, the symmetry route. It is also interesting that in this paper he directly discusses ARP's work and that a potential solution to some of the problems ARP had identified might be found in the plasma universe model. I hope you found this an interesting insight into Alvin's idea of cosmic evolution. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.